Opening statements began this morning in the trial of a chiropractor accused of a workplace massacre. Now, the state said in their opening statements that they intend to prove that the defendant, Chad Isaac, committed the gruesome murder of four employees at a property management company in Mandan, North Dakota. But in their opening statement, the defense highlighted the fact that their client had no motive for the murders and made a point of detailing all the other percent potential suspects who did. All right, let's bring in Court TV correspondent Chanley Painter, who is live with us from North Dakota. And Chanley, things got underway today in that North Dakota courtroom. Take us through what jumped out about openings to you. Well, the openings for the defense is what jumped out to me. The prosecution was succinct, really just building a timeline, an overview of what the jury will see in the prosecution's case about how they tied the quadruple murder to Chad Isaac, but didn't go into a lot of those details. Well, Michael, the defense did go into a lot of detail, spending around 90 minutes outlining what the state doesn't have. It did say what the state has, but really it was the point of there's no link to Chad Isaac. No DNA, they said, on any of the items and that he wouldn't have a motive to do this. He was a su successful chiropractor at the time and also pointed to other people who may have had a moment, a motive to do away with some of the employees at RJR, the management firm uh, here where the murders took place, including the wife possibly of the owner who the owner was having an affair at the time for many years of having an affair. The wife didn't know about that is what she told the police but it was so detailed that really left a picture for this jury to to be on the lookout for what the evidence will be from the prosecution's case and probably even thinking about it in a more critical way now knowing what they know after that defense opening statement. Yeah, it really was a fantastic opening statement and did exactly what you said, which is what you want to do as a defense attorney. Now, Chanley, the state, I believe, got through eight witnesses today. So take us through the highlights of some of today's testimony. It focused a lot on the procedural aspects of the case. It really did. So the prosecution seems to be going chronologically through the testimony of the witnesses. So they're calling the first responders, starting with the dispatch call to RJR management April 1st, early morning hours, around 7.30 a.m. before the business opened for the day. And then they're calling the the paramedics who responded to the scene. I think the, the biggest witness that stood out to me was the employee who showed up and found the owner, Robert Faulkner, on the ground. Who He talked about how he thought it was maybe uh, he fell and hit his head or some kind of a medical emergency. So all of the first responders were arriving to the scene thought this was a medical emergency. It wasn't until they noticed the amount of blood around Robert Faulkner that they knew this was something more severe. They started clearing the building. And like you said, about eight witnesses walking through almost the same story about how how they arrived, they discovered one deceased person, and then as they cleared the building, they found another. They found the cobs in the administrative part of the building where Lewis Cla Lois Cobb was actually in the bathroom part, her legs in the hallway, her husband across the hall in the office found deceased, and then Adam Fuhrer, the fourth victim, also found in the work by a workbench in the area of the office. Just devastating testimony. They talked about how they treated, tried to treat them, treated the scene, and they protected the scene. They tried to keep people out out of the offices because people were arriving to work that day and had no idea what had happened and this was so shocking to these first responders and many of them even talked about how they'd never seen a crime scene quite this bad. As a matter of fact, Chanley, the defense actually seized the opportunity um, to talk about the inexperience of the investigators and that's a little bit of a, of a theme uh, in their defense. It certainly is. You could tell right away on cross-examination how they started to pick apart how many people were at the scene. There was one point on cross-examination where they talked about there were four uh, groups of responders. There was the paramedics, two sets, two ambulances that arrived with the two paramedics each, and then the three firefighters who arrived, and then the Mandan police officers who arrived, and they're all going through the scene. So the defense trying to point out how many people were there, and then the employees showing up. Where exactly were these 
employees? Were they inside the building next to these bodies? Were they outside the building? Because again, we know the prosecution's case here. They're going to try to show a shoe impression that matches a shoe that Chad Isaac had in, in his home when they searched his home. So they also are even showing the, uh, having some of the witnesses today hold up their shoes or the bottom of their shoes to show that they had them photographed or what the shoe looked like that they wore at the scene that day. But you can tell, you're right, on cross-examination, them trying to point out the inexperience of some of these first responders, how the scene may not have been protected like it should have been protected. And then also talking about uh, who other people maybe had arrived and left. There was one interesting part on cross where one of the officers went outside and there was a a couple of employees pulled up in a white Honda and then sped off when they learned the police were there. Was that suspicious? So every chance the defense is getting, it seems as they're, they're trying to raise some doubt. No question about that. And Shanley, what can we expect tomorrow? We can expect a big witness, the wife of the owner, Robert Fockler. She's co-owner of RJR, still runs the business, Jackie Fockler. And remember, in opening statements, the defense said that her husband was having a long-term affair with a woman and named Lisa, and Lisa's husband was someone with a criminal record, was abusive, possibly pointing to a missed opportunity for the investigation to look into that person who actually may have motive to target Robert in this murder. So she's going to take the stand, though, tomorrow. That'll be a big witness for the prosecution, and we expect after her probably more investigators from the um, uh, Bureau of Investigation here in North Dakota. Yeah, and across promises to be interesting as well. All right, Chandler Panther, thank you so much for that report. We appreciate it. Reporting live from Bismarck, North Dakota. Right now, I want to go back to our think tank. Still with me is criminal defense attorney Eklund Mercy, former federal prosecutor Nima Romani, and the attorney who represented Jody Arias, Kirk Nurmi. All right, let me start with you, Kirk. Um, you know, this is an interesting case, and, and we were wondering as we got closer to the case what the defense was going to be. We really had no inkling, but they, they 90 minutes worth of questioning the evidence in this case, the motives in this case, and perhaps most importantly, suggesting some other people. There's a lot of people who had issues with that management company, so I think they did a great job. I think so, too. Uh, Chanley laid out a lot of the reasons for that, and we heard this theme of reasonable doubt through the concept of confirmation bias. Another thing that I thought was really brilliant through this opening is while the, while the defense attorney was weaving all this talk about reasonable doubt, he brought up his client's lack of motive, but also did so in a way where he talked about all the good things about his client. He talked about his client being a, a, being a vet of service. Uh, being a doctor, having no motivation, no prior criminal history, all these things that typically a defendant might have to get on the stand to say. And this defense attorney wove it into the conversation, negating the idea of maybe needing to put his client up and have him subject to cross-examination. So they did this brilliant job of questioning the police officers, vouching for their client, and really creating a, a situation where reasonable doubt is present in this courtroom now. And I think the state now even has a bigger hurdle to overcome when they try to prove this case against him. Yeah, Nima, one of my questions was going to be, how is the uh, defense going to get in front of this jury without the defendant taking the stand? The, the information that this is a guy who doesn't have any criminal background, had no motive in this case, um, is a guy who's a Navy veteran, a well-known chiropractor, really someone that you just would not think would commit this type of crime. They needed to get that information in front of the jury, which is difficult to do unless the defendant takes the stand. So how would they have done it? And I think Kirk mentioned... This was one way to talk about it in opening statements. Well, the defense did a good job in opening, but they're still way behind. I have to respectfully disagree with Kirk on reasonable doubt here. There's plenty of evidence. Let's just go through it. Less than a week before, there's video surveillance of Chad driving to the business and casing the business. There are fibers that put him in that stolen RJR vehicle. It was his vehicle that fled the McDonald's. And there's witnesses that are going to testify to that effect. But let's talk about the evidence that the search warrant uncovered at his house. And unless you believe this was a frame job or law enforcement planted that evidence, there's nine empty shell casing. Coincidentally, there were nine shots fired that killed those four victims. There's a bent knife. And guess why there's no DNA evidence? Because it was cleaned with bleach. The exact clothing he was wearing, the orange hooded sweatshirt, the orange mask, again, all at his house, gun parts that match the weapon. So unless you think Chan Isaac is the unluckiest chiropractor in the world that happens to 
come across this treasure trove of evidence that links him to a murder, I think the jury is going to see past all this and return a guilty verdict. Eklund Mercy, what do you think of the defense in this case? I am here for a 90-minute opening. I am curious to see how this closing will be. Will it take a day? Um, I am all all for the defense really picking at, um, you know, just picking at the case. I am curious to see how they're going to make it make more sense. Now, you know, motive is one thing. And I remember in law school, motive means nothing during trial. Motive is why somebody may want to do it. We're going to be focusing on intent. So I think that um, if the defense focuses on intent, um, they took the motive out. If they focus on intent, then they may have a, a, a reasonable defense to not put the defendant up as of right now. If they can shoot shots into the prosecution's case, then they can proceed without him having to take the stand. Now, Kirk, how do small town juries differ from big cities? I mean, clearly there's a mindset that's different. Um, they don't want to necessarily think some of one of their own committed this crime, but the same way, if they think someone's guilty, they're going to put them away. Uh, they don't want that person in their community. But are they more likely to one by this argument that their police department was too inexperienced, made a lot of mistakes, perhaps contaminated the scene, creating problems and perhaps creating reasonable doubt? Or are they even more interested in saying, we want to hear from this guy. He's from our community. He's one of us. We want to hear what he had to say. Well, I don't necessarily know that they're going to demand to hear from what to say. I think to some reason, jurors want to hear what people have to say. But people probably know everyone involved if not directly by reputation, right? And that's where I would dispute with Nima again. You know, to me, I think all the factors he brought up are certainly inferences guilt, but it's motive that ties all those pieces of evidence together. And I think a small town jury is going to be more skeptical to imprison one of their own based on, on an incomplete picture. And this is what we have here. They may not want to think bad of their police department, but they're certainly going to be more protective of one of their own who they know in the community, at least by reputation, without that tie of motive to tie all those pieces of evidence that, that Nima uh, pointed out earlier. Yeah, motive indeed could loom large in this trial. I really believe that. All right.